Good morning, good afternoon. Thanks for attending the Oracle integration webinar. I'm Jürgen Kress, part of the Oracle product management team. In case you missed one of our webcasts, on-demand recordings are available at Oracle Video Hub, including presentation for download. In today's presentation, Robert Wunderlich and Neil Kominski will highlight how to use Oracle integration as part of Oracle, of Oracle Cloud infrastructure. Good morning, Robert. What is an API? <laughs> Thanks. So uh, we're going to delve into API. It's actually three parts, uh, and I'll give you more details during my part of the presentation. Excellent. Good morning and good afternoon, Neil. What is the difference between an API and Oracle integration and how to combine them? Yeah, that's what you will see as well in my presentation in a few minutes. Okay. So objective of the call is to give us an update on Oracle integration cloud and how to ut utilize the underlying cloud infrastructure. Oracle Cloud Infrastructure has all the services you need to migrate, build, and run all of your IT from existing enterprise workloads to new cloud native applications and data platforms. For example, Oracle SaaS solutions like HCM, CX, and ERP can be connected and extended with Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Quick housekeeping. Today's session is live and this presentation is recorded. Please feel free to post your questions via the conference Q&A tool in the Zoom console. At the end of the webcast, we will answer them. Slides and an on-demand webcast will be posted at Oracle Video Hub at bit.ly slash watch OSE. We will post announcement and links in the conference chat. Please complete the online survey at the end of the webinar. As we will present product roadmap information, please pay attention to the Oracle Safe Harbor statement. Please do tweet and blog about products and services which are available today. Today's agenda, followed by the latest announcements, Neil will highlight the Oracle integration may release and introduce and demo the Oracle cloud infrastructure. Robert will present how to use APIs in combination with Oracle integration. We'll wrap up the session with questions and answers. So let's get started. We would like to invite you to attend Oracle Open World 2022. This year's conference takes place from October 16th to 20th in Las Vegas. You want to present your Oracle integration success story Call for paper is open until June 24th. We recommend to submit best practice sessions and customer success of leading edge cloud services like Oracle Integration and Digital Assistant. Please describe your journey in the cloud, including the benefits that have been achieved. Oracle Integration is part of the Oracle Cloud Infrastructure free trial program. Build, test, and deploy Oracle Integration and connect your applications. The trial is valid for up to 30 days. Use the documentation and training material to become an integration expert. Who are the experts who can support your customer project? System integrators like Accenture implement eight out of the top 10 Oracle integration projects. Choose a certified partner with OIC references to replicate the success. At Partner Finder, you can search for certified partners by competencies and region. At Cloud Marketplace, you can search for applications based on Oracle Cloud Platform. For example, Avanco offers third-party integration adapters for SAP or Amazon, or pre-built recipes from Activate. Questions need support? You can collaborate at Cloud Customer Connect. In discussion forums, you can share your knowledge, engage with industry experts, and network with the team and peers. You can submit your innovations and earn personal badges. Want to learn more from successful customer examples? Attend our quarterly best practice series. In case you missed the April edition, on-demand recording is available. Interested to present your success? Please let us know. Today's webcast is recorded and will be published at Oracle Video Hub, including the slides. For regular updates, please subscribe to the Oracle Integration Newsletter. The quarterly updates from our team include the latest product information, events, success stories, white papers, and training. With this short introduction, I would like to hand over to you, Neil. Hello. Hello, everybody. So let's look at the new features for May 22 release. Now, I've, I've got a slide deck for this. What I'm doing here is I'm just looking at you know, what we've uh, put up on blogs at oracle.com. And of course, you get a link to this. But salient points here in respect of Oracle integration, the payload limits have been increased to 50 MB from 10 MB for SOAP, REST, FILE, FTP, and SAP endpoints. And the payload limits for agent-based endpoints will be increased to 50 MB in a future release. And this will include SOAP, REST, SAP, um, FILE, and FTP. Now, this is very important because many customers, of course, had this issue. Mainly, I suppose, you know, uh, with the 10 MB limit, 
they were hitting, uh, you know, they were hitting that often and they were throwing errors or whatever. So it's great to see that that has been addressed. A new feature as well, a new role called the service end user. Now we have two types of service end users in OIC. Just think of somebody who has to go in and approve a human tasks, like approve an order in process. Um, so this service user role will just allow them to do that. They won't be able to access integrations, B2B file server, visual builder, any of the components whatsoever. They will purely be able to go in and do what they need to do. And of course, this is exactly what they want. They don't want to be distracted by seeing other menu items, et cetera, et cetera. And the same idea with Insight. Now, Insight, for those of you who don't know what is our out of the box, our very compelling out of the box, um, business user facing dashboards that sit on top of your integrations and processes. Now, it's very, very easy, of course, to instrument your integrations and processes to send data to uh, Insight. And of course, then the business user who looks at these dashboards uh, as, with this service end user role, they can go in and just look at the dashboards, create new widgets in their dashboards, et cetera, et cetera. Another important point, of course, about Insight is that these dashboards are embeddable in third-party apps. So for example, if you have um, integrations between you know, Salesforce and Fusion ERP, and there's line of business folks from finance who want to see what's going on in those integrations from a business perspective, then we can embed the Insight dashboard in Fusion ERP itself. Now, from the May release, you can activate up to 700 integrations per Oracle in instance. Now, the reason why I am highlighting this uh, may seem obscure to some people, but we do have some folks who are hitting that. And just to let you know that this is a soft limit. So just to let you know that you will be um, in the system health section, we will be highlighting this, the fact that, okay, you're getting near to this limit, but again, it's a soft limit. Nothing will happen if you create 701 integrations, everything will function um, as before. The idea here is to have some sort of a, a limit there that um, folks can realize there'll be some you know, point where the complexity will be too much for you, but 700 is soft limit. Okay, the email suppression list. Now, uh, we have an email circuit breaker where you can send up to 10,000 emails daily from our Oracle integration. Now, when this limit is exceeded, you know, do we have what's like a, a circuit uh, breaker? You know, we just don't start, we don't we stop sending those emails. And of course, this limit is there for a 24 hour window. And so we have to wait for the, that to um, elapse before. Uh, re refreshing that email count, so to speak. Again, this is something that probably affects very, very few customers, but just that you know that this is what's happening. Now, as and with every other release, um, or every release of OIC, we've got new adapters. Two of the ones that I'm highlighting here are the HubSpot and uh, QuickBooks adapter. Now, the HubSpot adapter is, a, is the latest and greatest addition to our CRM group of adapters. Like I've blogged already how you can actually use the REST adapter to integrate with HubSpot, but this adapter, of course, makes it even easier to do that. You know, like typical things syncing could be syncing uh, companies, syncing inventory products, et cetera, et cetera. Another adapter that we've just introduced is the QuickBook adapter. And of course, the QuickBooks is an ERP adapter. So, um, the initial release here will be supporting outbound invokes, enabling integration developers to do CRUD operations on your QuickBooks uh, business objects like create account, retrieve bill, update invoice, et cetera, et cetera. There are also enhancements to existing adapters. Now, again, I won't go into the details of each of these. They're on our blog um, and you will get the link to that. Like the Gyra adapter, Magento adapter, Zendesk adapter, Shopify adapter, and so on. I think the message here for you folks is that, you know, when we create these adapters or when we release these adapters, that's, that's just not it, you know? If there's new functionality available from an integration perspective from these apps, we will augment our existing adapters to support that functionality. So it's an ongoing service, so to speak, that you're getting from Oracle in respect of the adapters. We've also invested quite a bit of effort in producing recipes. Now, what are recipes? These are what you see when you log into the OIC homepage. You see a list of recipes, best practice implementations of um, integration use cases. 
So for example, here, uh, syncing accounts you know, between S uh, SAP and ERP. So you see, uh, see between Salesforce, sorry, and SAP ERP. So we've got a, a quite an amount of adapters of our quite of an amount of recipes available for you here. And of course, the idea here is this is you now this is the quickest integration you'll ever create. Take the recipe, point it to your SAP ERP and to your Salesforce, and this thing will work. Now, naturally enough, you, you will be putting, you may have to, or you may want to put some more customized logic in there. And of course, that's that you can do in OIC as well, because these recipes are just normal integrations. It's, uh, it's just the case that they will work out of the box for you, but you can customize them as necessary. So as I say, once you have a task that you need to complete in OIC, you can check, first of all, is there a recipe for exactly what I want? Or is there a recipe that kind of does 50, 60% of what I want, and then I just use that as, a, as an accelerator, so to speak. So that's the release that we have in May. And of course, the next uh, release is due in August. And for an example there, from an adapter perspective, we're looking at producing you know, Snowflake adapters. Uh, Coupa is on the roadmap as well, other adapters coming as well. Just the thing for you customers, if you have adapter requests or enhancement requests generally, please let us have them. So because an awful lot of our enhancements or most of our enhancements and new adapters, they are driven by you, by our customer base. Now I'm going to sw sw uh, switch over to PowerPoint and because of my new curved screen we might have issues, but folks, we're gonna be looking here now about OIC and um, OCI. And I just want to, Check here on that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so without further ado, let's have a look and see what we're talking about here. So Oracle integration, as you all know, is our toolkit here for connecting apps with application integration, for um, extending apps, for example, your Fusion ERP or HCM with process automation can also be used for creating custom human workflows, visual builder for creating uh, net new apps on top of your applications, file server speaks for itself and inside these business user facing dashboards on top of your integrations and processes so this is the toolkit within oic but oic itself is an oci service and there are a plethora of oci services that are of great interest to oic so I've listed some of them here. Now, and this is not an exhaustive list, list of OCI services. You can get that when you go to cloud.oracle.com. You log into your tenancy and you see all of them. But I just want to highlight some of the services that our customers are using to, you know, to address the business requirements that they have with OIC. So it's augmenting OIC with extra cloud services to fix the problems that we have. So the first I'm going to look at is API Gateway. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail here because that's why we, we have Robert. Robert is the subject matter expert here. But it's just a case here to have a gateway to control access to your, OC, uh, to your OIC endpoints. Now, this is very, very important. If you are exposing your integrations or maybe a subset of them to third parties. Or for example, you've got mobile app developers who need to integrate with enterprise systems of record a you know, mobile app giving a salesperson an overview of a customer's orders or whatever. So of course, those orders can be, treat, be retrieved via OIC. And then the mobile developer just goes through the gateway and gets that there. So the gateway again is controlling access and Robert is going to go into more detail about that. But suffice to say, OIC can publish endpoints easily to OCI gateway. So we just go in quickly to this and you see within OIC, you specify, okay, here's my API gateway service, so to speak. And within that service, I can have one or more gateways. And then within the integration sub or context sensitive menu in OIC, I see the API management um, menu option. And when I click on that, I get the, the dialog here while I can select the target gateway and I can specify a name for my integration API that's going or endpoint that's going to be exposed to that gateway. And of course, once I get into that gateway, I can add 
policies to this, request response policies. And as I say, Robert will be going into this in more detail. Now, one of the other compelling things about it, and Robert will be able to update you on that, is this is a very cheap service. Like, it doesn't cost you many dollars. It won't break the bank whatsoever to um, augment your OIC with the, Oracle, uh, or with the OCI API gateway. It's also a very important consideration. So it's, um, it complements uh, us um, very nicely. Now, one of the things that I was using this for was OAuth 2. And I have an example here on my blog that goes through exactly how you can actually do that. Now, this is a relative, relative uh, complex example, but it is something that's often requested um, by customers. And if you go to the blog, you'll see exactly how to do it. Now, at another level, we have the web application firewall. So the web application firewall, regional-based edge enforcement service. So what can we do with the WAF? How can that help us? Okay, it's you know cross-site scripting, SQL injections, um, uh, layer seven, DDoS, denial of service, uh, protection, threat intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. So if we look at this one here, we see within OIC itself, we have the ability to do allow listing. So this is also a relatively new feature there. Say, okay, only certain IP addresses can um, access OIC. And then before that, we can place the API gateway. And the API gateway is on this public subnet. And within that subnet, we can have a security list or network security groups. So here we're tying down you know, more and more fine-grained access to who, or fine-grained control of who gets access to OIC. And then we can augment that then with WAF here, which is sitting as well on the load balancer, just providing that extra level of security as well. So again, when you're looking at exposing your OIC services or access to OIC, you can check, you know, is this all I need? The OIC allow listing, or should I be putting the API gateway in there? And if needs be, you know, if uh, I need a WAF style uh, uh, support, then I can just use WAF there as well. So this is just an example of this thing here where we have, this is one we set up for uh, one of our customers where they have trading partners A and B and trading partner A can only use the top level URL there, the path A, trading partner B can only use part B. And then you can see the idea here with the access rule. So IP address one, two, three, four can use path A. IP address three, four, five, six can use path B. So just giving you a flavor of that. Now that's just one of the many access rules that are available with WAF, but just giving you a feeling for what can be done there. Now, the next thing we're going to look at is OCI logging and logging analytics. So many of you probably know, and for those that don't, you can easily enable your OIC instance to send its logs, i.e. the activity stream, to OCI logging. And from OCI logging, we can use what's known as a service connector to push it from logging to logging analytics. So within logging itself, or this OCI logging analytics, we have access to the OCI service metrics. So it's very, very important to note, okay, for OIC monitoring and logging management and log management and so on, within OIC, I have, of course, the monitoring UI, but at OCI level, I have a plethora of services that support me. For example, the service metrics here, which I can show, you know, which, you know, how many messages have been received in the last, you know, five minutes, whatever, I can specify then queries where I can say, I'm only interested in the messages for a specific integration. Now, this is an awful lot more flexible, I find, than what we have in OIC, which is a bit more static. And this is very, very useful down when we take it to the logging analytics um, stage, because the logging analytics has two uh, major functions here. One is called the log explorer, and the other is called the actual dashboards. So with Log Explorer, I can break down the activity stream, for example, and check, you know, this is a breakdown based on uh, integrations. So I see very quickly, you know, which are my top integrations from an execution perspective. 
Now the query that you can see in here, that query can be augmented. For example, I could add a payload value if I was, um, or a log value. For example, if I was logging order numbers as part of my integration, I could enter that log number there and I could drill down into that particular instance. So this is, this is very, very flexible here. Naturally enough, the dashboards are, are, are even better. And the dashboards are more static in respect of the widgets that are in here, but it's very easy to edit these dashboards and provide new widgets. So for example, we've got received message, successful message, failed messages, here the breakdown by integration. But what I can also do is add widgets here that would show the usage of specific adapters. So if I wanted to check the usage of a specific adapter, because one of my integrations, I was getting complaints from somebody that's saying it's taking a long time to update Fusion ERP. I could have a monitor here of that particular ERP adapter for that particular integration. So I could see over time how the adapter is performing. So this is very, very useful stuff that we have here. So with the OCI functions, now I'm powering through these, I know, but um, you'll get to the, the PowerPoints afterwards with the links to the blog posts and so on. So what can I do with OCI functions? Well, OCI functions is a serverless platforms that let us, you know, uh, create, run and scale applications without managing in any infrastructure. Net net, you can write your code here, your business logic that you cannot express easily in OIC. Like within OIC today, you can, of course, um, embed JavaScript libraries, but sometimes, you know, if you're used to doing things like uh, Java embedding that we have in Beeple and Soa Suite, you might find that not as uh, function rich as you would like. So here we can externalize the business logic here. I've created a very simple discount function, which says if the country, if the order is coming from Ireland, give it 20% discount. Otherwise, otherwise, customers are only getting a 10% discount which for me is a very, very fair, fair rule. So it's very, very easy within OCI functions using the cloud shell here to go in and create, create this, um, this function. So it's essentially, it's a Java class that's then exposed as a function. And once I have that exposed as a function, I can create a connection to that function and then I can use it in my integration. So here we see we're looking for an iBike and the order is coming from Ireland. So we're getting a discount of 20% here. So again, we have many customers really now using these OCI functions because it's so easy to externalize the business logic and then just invoke it via REST from OIC. Now, the next component I'm going to be looking at is um, OCI streaming. So OCI streaming is providing us with a fully managed, scalable and durable solution for ingesting and consuming high volume data streams in real time. Now that is something I just copy and pasted from the, from the, the documentation. Essentially, this is um, Kafka and um, we can use it to implement publish, subscribe use cases in OIC. You may see that if you want today to create publish subscribe or to use the publish subscribe pattern in OIC, you get a message saying politely that this is deprecated. And the recommendation is to use pub sub as we have here uh, with OCI streaming to have that functionality. Now going forward, we're looking at um, productizing this a bit more, like putting it in more as part of OC, OIC itself, but today you can explicitly use OCI streaming to implement publish subscribe patterns. So it's very, very simple in this respect. We see here, we've created our stream here. I've called it the product stream. And you can see I've got some values in here, like a, an iBike for 999 euros. And then going in here to use this OCI streaming adapter is very, very simple. Like it's published to the stream, consume from the screen, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a very, very simple integration that I have here that's actually publishing to that stream. Now, of course, here I'm using publish subscribe, one integration publishing, another integration subscribing. But of course, I could have multiple clients subscribing to this um, stream. 
So just don't think of it as something within OIC. You can push data to the big wild world out there using OCI streaming. So once I've published that, you will see here, I can go into the other integration and here I'm just doing the subscription. Very, very simple here. And of course, you can see the maximum number of records to be fetched, et cetera, et cetera. So we can do great aggregation here, which means that we get great performance with this as well, which is very, very important. You know, for example, if you had um, you know, pushing website behavioral data from, from your website, you know, how customers are, you know, what the customers are doing on your website, and you're pushing that data to a, a CX environment, where you could have, you know, 900 million, uh, 900,000 a million uh, messages per hour. So these are the sort of things that we have been doing with this uh, component here as well. So if we go back in here and we say, okay, this just showing you how this works. There are the two messages that I have in streaming and there I am picking them up here in OIC, just just showing you the activity stream of the subscription. So very, very simple, very, very succinct, and very, very easy to use. The next feature I'm going to look at here is um, AI vision. Now, AI is something that um, you know, everybody talks about AI. Every product is AI enabled, or nearly every product is AI enabled. But um, in this respect, I'll just show you what, I, what I'm looking at here. I've got a very, very simple example of what I need to do here. I've got documents. And they're in some content management system. Now, the content management system I use is object storage, a bucket in object storage, because it's the easiest thing for me to do. But just you can extrapolate from that. This could be any content management system. And the idea is just kind of get those docs and classify those docs and process them accordingly. So it's an intelligent document processing, you could say here with this. And so here we see OIC pulling data from or pulling documents from the bucket, pushing it to this um, OCI AI vision service. That's the name of this particular AI service. We have AI language, we have AI vision and some others in there as well. And then of course, that will return a response, which will tell us, you know, or which will include document type, you know, and then the key values of that document. So imagine if it's an invoice, what I want is the document type to tell me, okay, this is an invoice. You know, this is the customer address. And for example, these are the line items that I'm being invoiced for. And this is the final price, that sort of information. So an example here, when you go into AI vision. Now, AI vision is something you log into cloud.oracle.com, go into your tenancy, click on AI and AI vision, click on document AI. And you will see here, this example is already available for you here. Just showing you the power of this. So as you can see here, this is from a coffee shop and you can see here, okay, it's telling us it's a receipt. And then you can see how it's pulling out the salient information for us, also including the line items. So it's very, very easy for me in this, my particular scenario with the invoice to take that information from AI vision and push it to OIC process where I have a human task approval of this particular invoice. And of course, what I'm using in the background for this is the API and um, the Analyze Document API from um, o OCI A AI Vision for this. Now, I can just show you this here. Now, I'm going in here to... Now, I've just got this example here, and we'll just see if this works, because doing things live is always a bit exciting. So you can see here, I've got the document name. This is going to be a particular invoice that I'm pulling in from Object Storage. And so while that is executing, I'll just go over here and show you the show the, 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 the cold side of it, so to speak. So you'll see in here what this looks like. I've got my integration. Integration is here. And this is the vision processing demo. Yeah. So it may look a bit complex, but it, it really isn't. Like there's plenty of steps in here, but we all love uh, designing integrations with a bit of meat to them. So if we look in here, you can see the example here, getting the file from object storage, then pushing it to the AI vision here to do the analysis of the doc. And then I'm saying, if it's an invoice, 
And then you parse the response here uh, for each document field. And then you're saying, if it's the billing address, if it's a line item group, what are you gonna do here? And of course the line item group are, you know, the invoice line lines, you know, which products have I bought and whatever, which, what is the, the actual price of each individual item. But you can see here, very, very simple. And then I go over here and at the very end, what I'm doing is I am kicking off a business process for that thing to be approved. Okay, so it's a very, very simple scenario here, but it was very easy to actually implement this. And you can see here, it's gone through successfully. I go back up here, and if I go into my process here, it says, hey, my tasks, I should see then the actual, the actual task here. And there it is here, approve invoice from one minute ago. And we go in here, and this is this here. Oh, sorry, I went into the wrong thing there. Sorry about that. Clicking on this guy here, approve invoice. Yeah, here it is here. Okay, so we will see this here. There it is there. There's the invoice number, invoice date, the vendor, and I'm the customer Alliance um, applications and uh, appliances. And here are the line items. Paper towels, business cards, copier toner, and so on. So I just wanted to show you like the power that we do have within um, OCI to fix or you know to fix or to address business real business needs. So like for OIC, it's not just integrating app A with app B. It really is implementing these horizontal business processes um, across organizations as well. So now I'll just go back to the PowerPoint. Another component that we have in here, or two components that we're we'll dealing with here that really work together, is OCI events and notifications. Now, this is OCI events are everywhere within um, OCI. So every OCI service can raise events, and OIC can react to those events. And here's just an example of what I'm doing here. I have my object storage. And I'm using this as a, my content management, so to speak. And I activate emit object events at object storage level. So the event is, you know, a new object created, new ob or say object deleted, object updated, that sort of stuff. They're the sort of events I'm going to be having. And then I can add these rules here. Okay, if we have a new object created, in this compartment, and this is my bucket for my invoices, et cetera, et cetera. So I have this is in events. So I've created a that's an object storage. It raises the event and then it goes to events. And event says, okay, for new objects created in this compartment and in this bucket, the action is to write that to a topic. So we're going to notify notification type is going to be here to the topic. So now I go over to the other service, which is notifications. And in my topics, I have then the subscriptions. And I also have a subscription here, which just essentially invokes OIC. So very, very simple in this respect. Object storage emits the event, new object created. The events service has this rule, says, okay, in this case, I'm going to send that, to this, that message to this topic. And within notifications, I've got topics and subscriptions. And the subscription in this case is going to say, okay, for this event, you know, this message on this topic here, we're going to invoke OIC. And OIC can then start processing, you know, the newly created object in object storage. So you can extrapolate from that for, for the other OCI services as well. But just showing you the power of the platform that we have here. Now, the final component I'm going to be talking about, and I say this is not an exhaustive list, like I'm not covering OCI in respect of ATP or ADW, you know, databases and data warehouses. That's a subject for itself. But just covering the ones that I have seen customers using uh, quite a bit already. Um, and this one here, the OCI Vault. Now, OCI Vault managed service that lets you essentially manage encryption keys that protect your data and credentials, et cetera. Now, just going back to the example that I had with API Gateway 
doing the OR token processing for me in respect of OYC. So in this respect, it's going to need um, some values like um, the client ID, client secret, and so on. So these secrets I have stored in the vault here. You can see them down here. There's those secrets. They're installed there, yeah? And on the left-hand side here in the block of code, you can see that those variables are being addressed with these names, like API Gateway, IDCS, App Client, et cetera. And over on the next slide, you will see here the configuration of the function. And here we say, okay, we've got this key and this key relates to the OCID of that particular secret in the vault. So that's how these things hang together. So if you need to do stuff in your functions where you're talking about you know, invoking other services where client ID secrets are needed, you can externalize those to the OCI vault and then very easily address them in your function code here, okay? Now, the summary here, okay, o OIC is an integral part of the OCI ecosystem. And OIC plus all of these services or many of these services make it very easy or make it much easier for you to implement end-to-end -end business automation. Because there's always gonna be requirements out there that go, uh, go above and beyond simple data synchronization. So there's references there to the different uh, documentations and so on, so that you can, if you want, you can have a look at them yourselves. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Robert. I'm gonna talk about where we are today. I'm also gonna talk about some things, you know, that are coming up. So just be aware, you know, some of the things that you hear about or that you see uh, that is always subject to change. Now, Neil kind of, touched on this area about OIC using all of these OCI services. We're Oracle, we love to, uh, you know, throw acronyms around. <clears throat> I would say, you know, uh, just for clarity, OIC is Oracle integration. And then of course, OCI is the Oracle cloud infrastructure. The Oracle cloud infrastructure is the platform that Oracle integration runs on. So if you think about it in a stack, you have uh, at the very base layer um, identity, uh, networking, compute, um, services like API Gateway and Load Balancer and WAF. And then, of course, you have services like uh, Oracle Integration. And, and you kind of bring your way up to, um, uh, you know, the SaaS and, and, and those elements. So API Gateway is just really an underlying infrastructure component used by Oracle Integration. Now, before we get into the architecture and discuss that, I want to just take a moment to kind of uh, set a level of vocabulary, because a lot of times we talk, we use the term API. A uh, matter of fact, that's uh, address, directly addressing the question that Jurgen had asked me um, in the very beginning. Thanks for putting me on the spot, Jurgen. But uh, <laughs> is that an API has three components in, in my mind. Um, and, and a lot of times when we talk about this, especially in my world, I focus very much on the gateway, the policy enforcement, design, and I may, I may talk about that, but what might not come through is the nuance of the implementation. <clears throat> so the way that we're building our platform is that you have this model where you can create your API design, you can have a standardized approach to policy enforcement at the infrastructure layer, and then as the developer, you have the choice of the implementation technology that best fits your use case. So as Neil talked about, there's this case with OIC, which has a robust adapter framework, has a lot of process automation capabilities. You can do complete end-to-end -end business processes in a relatively low code approach. And that makes a lot of sense. There are cases where you may say, I just need to write a serverless function. You saw where Neil was calling a serverless function uh, you know, from OIC, because it was part of a broader kind of business orchestration. But if you have something where you'd say, look, I just need to write a piece of code. I just need to express this as, as an API. You shouldn't have to take a complete integration platform to do that. As a matter of fact, some of the players on the, in the market, the API management market, what they did is they took their enterprise service bus 
Uh, and then they just tacked on API management. They kind of rebranded it. But what's really running under the covers is the full enterprise service bus, which uh, I don't agree with that approach because I believe that that can widen the attack surface. Uh, as a matter of fact, if I can switch real quick, just to show you, I was just looking at this before, you know, there's a report that was talking about the, the growth of APIs and the growth of security incidents that are happening with APIs. So we really have to look at this security first. And API security really applies to any kind of implementation style that we're using. So we took a decision to develop an o what we call internally an OCI native, but it's really just a cloud native um, serverless uh, API gateway service that you have available to you as a network attached device that you can use for both uh, implementations that you use through, uh, you do through OIC, but also uh, any kind of other implementations. So if you're writing custom code and containers, if you're, you know, you have some integration, you might be doing some visual builder functions, Apex, all kinds of stuff. You can use a common policy enforcement layer. And so that's our kind of focus, or our view as to where we're going with this. Now, when we set out to do this, <clears throat> and we had a Gen 1 version of an API, you know, platform, which was kind of a standalone uh, offering that, you know, you, you would go and install components and uh, it kind of had this weird uh, uh, almost competition with integration. Like it would do some transformations and stuff like that. And what we really determined is we really want to decouple these things because we want to go and take a security first approach. So we delivered an API gateway. Uh, we have, uh, I think now we're up to over 10 uh, different compliance certifications and I'll call those out uh, shortly. Uh, we've uh, added MTLS support, so mutual TLS of, uh, that's really critical in banking and healthcare. So if you're using Oracle integration and you need to, you have an endpoint, an API that you've implemented in Oracle integration, and you need MTLS, you can use API gateway in front of that and protect that endpoint uh, with uh, mutual TLS. OAuth, JOT, all that good stuff. What we're building right now and in the process of is we are building um, uh, support for things like OpenID Connect uh, and some extended policy support for dynamic auth and resource, you know, based, uh, resource based, uh, request based auth, rather, dynamic routing. We have a, uh, this model. If you look at Oracle, and this is kind of the problem we're having to solve, is um, we have the largest portfolio of SaaS offerings in the market. Right through all of our acquisitions. Uh, matter of fact, you've heard of the Cerner acquisition that just was announced. Uh, we're running a lot of services, and we need to basically be able to run those on our cloud. And we actually need to provide a uh, unified uh, gateway, security gateway for our internal services. As a matter of fact, we run more traffic on our gateway through our internal services, our internal customers using our gateway. Um, um, by by large margins, we're talking billions numbers of, of requests, you know, running running through the gateway, uh, you know, from from our internal SaaS. So so you may actually be using our gateway without knowing you're using our gateway uh, because you're uh, using one of the SaaS offerings. The next thing that we're going to do when we look at that with security first, we're you know focused. That's kind of first and foremost is the, the full lifecycle API management. So we're working on uh, building a new developer portal that we're uh, bringing in. So this is where uh, Oracle integration customers who are uh, developing integrations can go publish those integrations to integration portal. We're gonna change a little bit how we approach this. There was a question I, I marked that I would answer live, uh, was this limitation of, hey, I create an integration and I you know, wanna create this as an API. And you know, uh, with that, uh, I'm kind of limited. I, I think right now API gateway is, is based on the deployment architecture, um, basically has a, a, a soft limit of 20 uh, you know, API deployments. And some of it is because a deployment can have many different routes and there's a lot of contextual linking and you know, kind of how you structure this. When you look at um, uh, Oracle integration or any implementation style, you're generally doing what we call a fine-grained uh, exposure of an API. The ultimate API that you're exposing to partners is more likely a coarse-grained 
uh, API. So like, for example, you may have a sales order that has maybe five different endpoints. Those shouldn't be five different, you know, deployments. It's probably just the sales order API. We need to be able to kind of collapse that together. Um, these, we, we provided a capability that, that Neil showed with Oracle integration that, hey, you can just publish an integration as an API. But one of the things that that does currently, and of course, this was kind of the initial steps as, as we were implementing this, is it takes that backend integration and just makes it a front end API. And 99% of the time, you don't just take a back end implementation and just express it as a front end to your partner. There's a difference uh, between the two. So we're working on this kind of capability where integration developers will be able to publish integrations. Uh, and then API managers will be able to choose from those integrations to configure backends and structure you know, uh, APIs. So there's a limitation that we're running into with, with limits right now. Uh, and of course, if, you, if you're in that issue, you need to, you can put in a request uh, in your console for API Gateway to, you know, increase limits and we can, we can talk with you and, you know, work with you in the short term of how to uh, address your business as, as we're you know, developing those capabilities. Um, monetization. We just delivered API usage plans. I'm going to take some time for show and tell during this call. We'll talk about that. Um, and, and so we'll get into that, but we're building from usage plans. That was our first step integrations with subscription management systems and other, other things, dashboards and whatnot, you know, expanding those out. API design, I want to give you a sneak uh, peek at that uh, as what we have coming about uh, in the uh, cloud editor with the design editor and how we're going to be working towards integrating that with uh, OCI DevOps. All right, so let me go ahead and get a move. I'm taking a little more time than I planned and I want to get time for demo. Uh, but just real quick, uh, just as a kind of an exploded view, if you look at compliance, which I think is super important, and remember, security first, compliance first, that's kind of our number one uh, investment. As a matter of fact, in our priority, security is always uh, number one, and then everything else you know, comes after that. So things like FedRAMP High, you know, PCI compliance, HIPAA, all of the uh, high trusts and you know, CSA stars, all, the, all these things. Um, and I'm sure there's probably some more compliances that I missed on here. So... That's super important. You're making this API available, this endpoint available. Uh, the first thing I want to make sure is that you have security. Uh, you have availability, obviously, API gateways available in all your regions worldwide. Uh, we're 30 plus regions. I forget the exact number, but you know, API gateways and all of those in the gov regions, everything like that. Uh, obviously, the security components we have integrated with the uh, things like network security groups, uh, you know, with OCI certificates and things like that. Um, Okay, so let's talk about usage plans. This is a brand new feature. We just announced it uh, in May. And, and, you know, what is this? This is, to me, this is kind of one of the key pillars of why we would use an API gateway. As Neil showed in his diagram, very rightly so, you had this kind of WAF out towards the edge layer, and then you kind of had this API gateway, uh, and then you're coming in. The reason why we structure it that way is because a WAF is not just running APIs. You can have web applications and, and things like that that you're actually um, uh, supporting with a WAF. You know, you're, you're, you're protecting more than just RESTful API. So we, we take this layered approach, right? If the WAF has basically passed uh, you know, its validations and its checks, then you get into the uh, API gateway, which is gonna do kind of user authorization. Uh, and then of course, it's gonna do things like the, the SLAs, the rate limiting with the usage plans and, and, and some things like that. If, if the request comes in and it, and it doesn't pass the WAF, it doesn't even get to the gateway. Uh, if it doesn't pass the gateway, you know, you're protecting uh, Oracle integration, right? Your, your integration layer that's actually doing all of this process management and everything, uh, you have this additional layer, you know, of security. So it's a layered approach to security. And if you, if you study any security, um, you know, paradigms from physical security to network security, logical security, you're always looking at this kind of layered approach uh, that you have there. So with usage plans now, this is where uh, this is a, a feature I'm really excited about a capability. It was a major release, and the reason being is because I think that anybody who's developing um, code, developing you know, delivering services, they kind of have some of the same essential questions that I do, <laughs> and it is um, who's using my service, um, how much you know are they using it. Who are my top users, right? You know, what kind of service or group of services is kind of generating kind of the most usage? You know, what's going on there? Um, and then of course, there's some things of, hey, I want to protect 
you know, my services. So we already have rate limiting uh, in the gateway. You can rate limit, you know, for an API to protect your backend, or we can do a kind of a fair share against the, you know, client IP. But now you can break this down to the subscriber. You can say, look, the subscriber is onboarded with us to have a collection of APIs, a certain quota or rate limit, you know, kind of controls for them. And no matter where they come from, whatever IPs, you know, what APIs they hit, this is, the, this is what I'm going to apply across the board. But then I can also get metrics and understand my business. And we always, um, API, uh, there was a few years back, there was a, a case in Harvard Business Review about Expedia getting 90 plus percent, you know, of their revenue in uh, monetization. And of course, you know, uh, all the vendors, <laughs> guilty as charged, you know, jumped in and said, hey, monetization, you know, that's, that's the way to go. Um, that's all grand, but uh, I think a lot of times people struggle with, well, I have this kind of API and I'm not really sure how I can actually turn it into a direct revenue stream. And I want to say with usage plans, you don't have to. It really kind of comes down to being able to identify and report on the value of what you've developed. Uh, so if I'm talking to my management and I, and I walk in and I say, look, here's my service. You know, my service last last month did, you know, a, you know about a billion requests with this customer, right? <laughs> you know, th that's saying something, right? I mean, that, that's that's kind of a thing where you can you can really kind of put those numbers to it. So this is, of course, rate limiting everything. And, you know, this is why he really cares, obviously, the value uh, to it. So just I'm going to lay out some of the resources, kind of give you an example, uh, and then we'll get into actually taking a look at some of it. Matter of fact, um, so essentially what you have is subscribers, you have usage plans, you have API gateways. We had uh, usage plans capability in our Gen 1 offering, and we took a look at that. And we looked at how can we do it better, and I'll point out some of those areas that uh, I think you'll agree that you know we, we really kind of nailed that. So... Subscribers, this subscriber, of course, is the client. It can be like your application, your mobile app or whatnot. Your usage plans are obviously uh, defining the limits and also the entitlements, the APIs that are included in that. And then, of course, where the APIs actually are, those gateways. So let me, let me lay out an example real quick. So let's just say on the left-hand side, I have you know four plans, gold, silver, bronze, and trial. So trial is kind of like, hey, anybody who signed up with me, they can try the APIs, but in, you know, until they actually onboard into a real plan, um, you know, they're, they're not gonna get a very high limit. It's really just to kind of test things out. I used animals, pets, uh, whatever. I don't know if you consider an otter a pet, but let's just go with it. Uh, this is kind of an example, right? So you kind of say, look, if, you, if you're paying me or set up for the gold plan, you can get 100 per second, 5,000 know, per minute, however you want to structure this. The quota is you know, minutes, hours, you know, days, weeks, and so, so, so on and so forth, and rate limits are, are seconds. So if you look at these like three or four subscribers, subscriber one is you know, gold plan. So basically they can call every API, uh, the, the aggregate of those APIs, the call, so they could call, you know, all um, five, yeah, five APIs, and that rate limit is going to apply, you know, for their calls across them all. So rate limits for the APIs are protecting the APIs, the back end, but we're also kind of protecting that that user only has so much that they can, they can go with. Uh, you know, your second subscriber has a bronze in trial. So if you look at this, you go, wait a second, you know, they have two plans. And when we approached this, what we did is we built in the capability that you can actually assign a plan to a user for what they upgrade to. But if the API is not in the plan, then the gateway will actually follow a priority to the next plan to apply against that. So like, for example, a subscriber two went and called you know, the dogs API. Uh, they're in the bronze plan, they get fish and birds. Um, and then, of course, they're not, they don't have dogs. So it's not going to work into bronze plan. So then the gateway would actually drop to trial and would go against that quota, uh, that, that bucket, is, if you will. So this allows you to kind of provide a layered approach at runtime that you can kind of structure your users to say, look, they can upgrade you know, their services for some APIs depending on the plan, but then the other ones, it's not, a, it's not an all or nothing. Uh, they can actually have kind of a, a fall through uh, approach. Okay, so the way that we approach this as to um, you know, configuring and setting this up, and we, we put a, a good bit of thought into that as to the different players. So there's two main uh, roles. And of course, uh, depending on how your company operates, it can be the person wearing two hats, uh, same person, and they're not limited in any way, but you can separate that out. 
So the API developer, you know, can decide whether an API is eligible to be governed by a plan. So it's just simply saying, yes, this is eligible uh, or no, it's not. So they kind of have an idea to say, look, uh, I don't want additional rate limits. I don't want to allow a product manager or, or an API product manager, or plan manager to assign additional limits for whatever reason. So they can go ahead and decide that. The other way that we also design this capability though, and this is really critical, is um, classical legacy API management systems. They would usually say, oh, you know, pass us a header or a query string and, and you know, call it API key, or you know, we might give you the ability to like change the name, but that's what you have to do. And that's all well and good if you're creating new APIs. Uh, but if you are uh, taking existing APIs, so say uh, you're, you have your APIs running and you, know, you actually want to start capturing the value, you look at this and you'd say, uh, you know, how do I do that? Because now I'm going to tell all my clients, they now have to pass an API key. I got to add them to subscribers and so on and so forth. This is a highly configurable where you can actually choose what part of the request represents your key. So, and I'll show you as an example here where there's a request where the client actually, you know, has no idea, doesn't even indicate what their key is, but I can actually derive their key uh, because I use uh, a different token for authorization and I can take it out of that, out of the auth context. If that API is eligible, and this is another uh, area, it doesn't yet become enforced until a plan manager goes and entitles it into a plan. So this was actually a common challenge you would run into where um, somebody, you had to actually do like an app key policy inside your API uh, to, to enforce that. And of course they, they would do that. And then all of a sudden the gateway would start like stopping all calls <laughs> because it, they didn't have plans and subscribers set up. It just said, you didn't pass me a key. I got a policy, it's, it, it was looking for a key, give me a key. And, you know, so it's kind of a mess. So, you know, the way that we designed this is we said, look, on the API developer side, they're gonna do two things. One is they're gonna say, is this eligible? And they don't have to say, explicitly yes or no, it basically the act of identifying uh, what the element of the request, so this is in their API design kind of that contract, what represents the API key basically says, yes, it's eligible. If it is eligible, then the plan manager can say, okay, I'm going to entitle this into a plan and the plan manager can kind of control you know, that path when they're starting to take that over, that governance, if you will, uh, for those subscribers. Okay. So I talked enough through that. Let me just go ahead and jump into a uh, the the uh, console and just for a quick time check. Let me know you're going to find running into any issue with time that I need to be aware of. Um, so let me see if I didn't get logged out. I think I'm good. We'll find out. Uh, let me go ahead and get into developer services. I'm going to do a little bit of just a walkthrough here so that you can kind of see uh, some of the things, some of the elements, and 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 what I'm talking about. So what you'll see when you come into API gateway with gateways and whatnot, you're going to see this usage plans and subscribers. So I have a gateway here and I have traffic running in the back end. I'm going to actually fire some more off just for fun uh, that we'll see. So this red one is a developer plan uh, in this uh, blue one or you know, whatever you want to call this is blue. is kind of the gold plan. So these are two different customers or clients. And they're going against uh, two different uh, two different plans. And so what you're going to see is on the red one. I just sent a bunch of requests. Uh, so essentially, uh, you know, 500 requests got sent. Only five percent, you know, five to six percent passed with success because this is a developer trial plan. And so I've actually locked them down. So they got about 29 requests through, and 471, the gateway said, "No, you hit, you know, you hit, you hit your quota. You're done." Uh, if I come over to the gold plan, which you'd see is I sent 1500, I ran this for about 10 seconds and this for about 30 ish or so I got about I sent about 1500 to request through, I got about 62%. Um, and of course, there's uh, 200 got, you know, 200 uh, status code 934 of them and of course 566. You know, why did this happen? Why, you know, why is the gold plan not doing better? And that's because I have somewhere another window. Um, uh, if I can get it without hitting the zoom bar, um, let's see if I can get that. If I can't, then okay. Um, there's another window in my background that's actually sending continuous traffic. Demo, demo trick, right? Make sure you send continuous traffic so you get charts like this. Um, so what you see here is in the metrics on this gateway is yeah, you know, this is the normal gold plan that's coming through, and this is actually that dev plan that's kicking off some um, you know errors and things that it's running into that is getting limited. Um, so let's go ahead and delve into that a little bit deeper. 
So if I go ahead and look at usage plans, uh, I'm going to go ahead and look at the trial plan. So remember the trial plan, I included uh, everything on that. You can see I've kind of kicked this request. It's only periodically that I kicked that one. Um, so if I come into it, if I edit it, just, just to kind of show you, is there are these entitlements. Now, this is kind of another interesting area that we kind of expanded this out. It used to be a plan was kind of, you have a plan, you have an entitlement, a list of APIs. Here, you can kind of group them. So you can have multiple entitlements. So like when I look at the... Um, trial entitlement, I set my rate limit and my quota, uh, and then I set my targeted deployments. So like in this case, if I said I wanted to add a deployment, I could come in and I could say, okay, I'm going to go ahead and, and select um, uh, fish. I don't uh, know. I have fish. Uh, do I have any? Uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. I think I have, um, I'll add echo service, even though I think there was something else there that I had. Um, so, so that's basically where I would select that. It actually says it's already been targeted. This was my uh, check because I have this in this test echo uh, in, entitlement, so I wouldn't be able to. But that's how uh, I would add that uh, into the list. I'll show you that in another plan that I'll go take a look at in a moment. Um, so anyway, that, that's how I would update that plan. So let me cancel out of this real quick, and I'm going to come back into usage plans. And I'll go ahead and go into my gold plan. So this one uh, you know, is running, obviously, a lot more volume. Uh, I can see the subscribers, only my developer two is, is on there. And I can see at the, at the subscriber level uh, what's going on you know, with, with my, uh, uh, that particular subscriber. So I can see every so often I'm getting some rate limits. You know, maybe I want to take a look at that. I could set alarms on that, by the way, be alerted. Uh, but I you know, would, may want to have a conversation with, with that uh, subscriber because uh, I obviously want to make sure that they uh, are able to access the API and they're not you know, having issues. So this could be like, hey, let's have a conversation. It looks like you had a junior developer you know, write a loop <laughs> that's hammering the API, you know, limiting it on you uh, or, or, or something like that. So we want to make sure uh, you know, we, we can go ahead and do that. Um, so, so that's kind of like at the subscriber uh, level. And of course, I can come in for the subscriber. This is another thing that we did, which is kind of interesting. Um, so when you have a subscriber and you have the notion of the quote unquote client key uh, or token, we call it a token, not a key. And, and I, I'm going to go ahead and take a moment and pause for, for a second. Do not use this as your security. You should always use um, a, an authorization like OAuth2. Uh, you know, security uh, uh, on top along with this. Uh, a lot of players out there, you know, a lot of customers, and of course, we know it's done and we know you do this internally, you take that trade off and, and then that's, that's okay. We understand kind of quote unquote bending the best practices. But, you know, just be aware that if you take a token that doesn't have like a time to live, like OAuth2, it's not, you know, kind of separately being supported by your, your IDP and stuff like that, uh, we don't consider that secure. So we consider API tokens as identifiers or account billing identifiers, and it should be used coupled with, um, you know, API keys or, or whatnot, you know, this, this kind of model. But, you know, we know it's done. And of course, you can, you can do it uh, you know, with this. The interesting thing, though, is what happens when you want to rotate tokens? You know, you say, hey, I want to change the token, but I have existing clients using the, exi you know, the, the current token. We made this capability where you can actually define multiple clients uh, you know, for this. So I think it's up to five clients. So you can have different clients for different apps, if you wish, under your subscription plan and keep them separate. And of course, you can also add and rotate you know, control when, when the other one was out. This is this uh, hierarchy that I was telling you about. So uh, I've, you know, if you want to add a usage plan, so if I came in here and I said, look, I want to add the silver plan uh, to this or internal APIs or whatever, you know, I could go ahead and add that plan, and then I can go and move it up and down the line. And this is the the uh, that priority. So what happens is, is when a client goes and invokes, you know, makes a request and invoke the API, uh, API. Gateway will basically check to see if that API is entitled within their full plan. And if it is, then it will use that quota. If it's not, it'll then go to trial plan, so on and so forth. And of course, if it's not at all, it'll reject the request. Okay, so that's uh, kind of uh, that with clients and, and, you know, with usage plans. Now, another thing just to call out real quick is a dashboarding. And Neil talked about this with logging analytics. And there's also another capability, and this is dashboards at OCI. So one of the things you can do is you can very easily build dashboards off of the metrics so that you can go through and monitor and, and manage 
uh, you know, those those customers or those um, uh, usage of subscribers and, of course, the, uh, you know, different um, usage plans. So, so you have a lot of dashboarding, a lot of capability for, you know, uh, visibility out there. One other thing I want to talk about uh, that I didn't touch on before, so I'm just going to jump back over into um, my gateways. And I'm going to take a look at one of these APIs so I can show you uh, kind of what it means to configure uh, the API. So let's go ahead and look at, you know, good old otters here. Remember I talked about, I said, look, you know, there's a case where you may have this, you know, API key as a header or query string, but uh, I think as a best practice is to do this slightly different is first of all, have an auth token. So, so that's super important. Um, and then of course, um, uh, basically make it to where the user, the, the client is not actually the one specifying directly uh, that API key. So if I come into this API, there's a new uh, feature here. So this is uh, first off validated by OAuth. I have it going against uh, IDCS and I'm doing a uh, job validation or JWT validation. But you have usage plans. This is the part where the API developer comes in and says, is this eligible? And how they do that is they basically just say, where's the token location? So I've actually taken the, the client ID. So in my uh, identity provider, I create a client application. In OAuth, you have a resource application, and then you can have one or more client applications. So my resource application is what represents my API. And then I've created multiple client applications. So what I've done is I've taken my JOT and I've just translated it so we can take a look at that. So my client ID here is, uh, is in my JOT. And so as the client, the only thing I'm doing is going to the IDP and I'm authenticating with the IDP. I'm getting an access token, a bearer token, and I'm using that bearer token to invoke the API. The gateway is able to take that from the auth context, from that bearer token, and is able to go in and, and validate that as a subscriber. So when I come back into the gateway, you can see I've configured this location where you find that. So if I go back over into subscribers, for example, and we'll go ahead and look at like say developer two, um, and I can see my clients, which you'd see here, and I can't remember which one's which, but one of these I've configured as my IDCS API developer two. So all I'm doing is just matching that up. Um, so, you know, after this call, I'll be resetting those, but <laughs> it says you show uh, any kind of ID, never show those on web conferences unless you uh, intend to uh, change those. But this is something that I think is really compelling on two fronts. One is you take out of the client's, the, the client's hands, so to speak, the setting of that uh, uh, usage plan subscriber identifier. So uh, you, you use a proper OAuth approach, you're securing your APIs and you are defining that based on your client application that you've configured uh, in your IDP. Uh, we can auto-generate a token for you. You can use that if you're doing simple API keys or you can just put in any kind of API key as long as it's unique. And so I just take that and, and put that from my IDP. Uh, you know, into the subscriber. So the first thing is take it out of the user's hands, uh, the client's hands. The, the second, uh, you know, element is I can take existing APIs that are already, you know, doing auth authorization, right? If I already have that in place, I can start to apply usage plans and start to capture the value and segment my customers without any action required by my customer, by my client. Um, one last thing, I know it always kind of keeps coming up, but I'll just go ahead and, and, and see if I can jump over it real quick. Uh, if I look at, um, say like my uh, uh, silver plan, for example, uh, and I go to uh, edit this, um, you know, I can see I didn't have my entitlement there, but let me just jump in here real quick. Uh, so I can say enable a rate limit, I can set these amounts and stuff like that. Um, I also can come in and um, let me cancel out of here real quick on the subscribers, come into my developer, uh, go ahead and edit. Uh, so, so you kind of have the usage plans. I do have an area where I can switch this to be um, uh, permissive or blocking, right? So I could say, do you want to reject this or do you want to, uh, you know, allow uh, the request? So uh, all of these are locked. So if I go into my uh, gateway, uh, I'll come over to integration test, get into my deployment, and I've been hitting, I think, otters. 
uh, yep, there's that API. That's the one that's been getting hit. I can come in. Uh, and of course, I can go look at my logs. And what I'll see is from my log outputs, uh, I can see, you know, the, the um, uh, permitted, right? Usage plan, quota counter, uh, permitted. And of course, if it's when it's rejected, it'll say it's rejected. And I can bring this all into logging analytics and I can kind of, you know, structure everything and show, you know, based on that, you know, where, where that comes from. So I can see what the tier is. In a premium tier, it's in the gold plan. It, this this request was you know permitted for the subscriber developer too. So there's a lot of visibility that we you know get there, but we can go and implement this. You know, we can kind of take our existing services and and start to capture the value. So I think that's uh, really worthwhile. Okay, so with that, all I just want to do is just say uh, I think I'm good, done. Yes, thank you. Um, if you want to learn more, go to oracle.com slash API. It's where, where that is, and we'd be glad to uh, hear from you, uh, get your feedback. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you, Jurgen. So for more information, please visit the integration website and the documentation. The same for API management. There is a website and there is a link with training material that goes to a Coursera course at bit.ly slash train API. The blocks that Neil showed and the integration block and my own past community block. And please subscribe to the newsletter for the quarterly updates. Thanks very much, Robert, for the interesting presentation. And thank you, Neil, for the update and how to use the Oracle Cloud infrastructure, which is part of Oracle Integration Cloud. We would like to say thank you for attending today's webcast. Please join us at the net next webcast, September 15th. And please complete the online survey once you log out the webinar. Thank you.